Good morning. Listen as I read a poem by Walt Whitman. This poem is titled, A Noiseless, Patient Spider. <clears throat> a noiseless, patient spider. I marked where on a little promontory it stood isolated. Marked how to explore the vacant, vast surrounding. It launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the grossomer thread you fling catch somewhere, O oh my soul. Well, there are a number of words in that poem that we don't use on a regular basis. The image is vivid. Here, the poet watches a noiseless little spider, this tiny being in a vast space reeling out filament, 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 <clears throat> seeking something to which to anchor. And the poet muses on his own life, <clears throat> this being in a vast universe, building Bridges till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold. <clears throat> it leads us to ask the question To what do we anchor our souls? In my flock note yesterday, I opened with the question, on a scale from one to 10, how firmly anchored is your soul? In a world where Many do not put their trust in God. In a world where hopes are built on a number of other things, on establishing an education system, on improving economics, on improving health, on improving connections with others, on experiences, on building organizations, 
on distractions or worse, on addictions of various kinds. <clears throat> At various times and in various ways, people have sought to anchor themselves in different things with the hope that these was that these would provide the anchoring that they need. <clears throat> it takes a storm of life sometimes to realize how uncertain these foundations stand. Money comes into our bank accounts and then takes wings and flies away. <clears throat> we may be healthy one day and the next day we get the diagnosis of advanced cancer. <clears throat> Our successful job to which we have devoted perhaps years or even decades of our life, it ends one day and we are left in a period of uncertainty. <clears throat> Friends or family members on whom we have depended for some time and on whom we have placed our trust may leave us for one of any of a number of reasons. And even our educations, which provided a solid foundation for a stage of our life, <clears throat> eventually need to be replaced with new knowledge of new industries. And the degree that is on our walls, while it may have been a great blessing, is not something upon which we can place our ultimate hope. Sometimes we place things that may be a blessing into a place where they do not need to be, where they could displace God and become an idol. <clears throat> the letter to the Hebrews is written to a group of Christians who had started well and yet were becoming lax in their faith. They were becoming sluggish or they were becoming unmoored from their faith. They had begun with Christ, but now they were slowly becoming detached from him or becoming stagnant in their faith. This letter opens up with reminders to the hearers that <coughs> there is nothing that can exceed the greatness of Christ. Christ cannot be compared with any other source of hope. Christ is higher than the angels. Christ is greater and better than Moses. And Christ is greater than the old covenant that God established with Abraham. In chapter 6, of the book of Hebrews, starting with verse 13. The, he, the writer of the letter to Hebrews says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, 
since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> There's a lot said in that passage. And these verses serve as a bit of a bridge between what he was talking about in the first section of the book of letter of Hebrews and the topics that he will start to take up in chapter seven. We ended last week with the verses in, uh, leading up to this passage. And one might begin to think based on his exhortation to the recipients that our hope is largely based on our own performance. Let's reread this. In chapter six, by way of reminder, The, the author reminds the Hebrews, he says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire that each of you show the same earnestness and have full assurance of hope until the end so that you might not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises let's unpack that for a moment what happens if we get sluggish in our faith what happens if even for a period of time, we leave God? We start straying into some other pursuits. We, it may not happen all at once, but like a slow leak, the air gets let out of our faith. Pretty soon <laughs> those tires are getting pretty sluggish. They're not moving the car down the road. And we might abandon those tires for different tires and say, okay, I'm going to try some other tires and see if they're going to get me where they need to be. But those new tires take us 
nowhere we want to go either. They take us to a far journey away from God. We find that we are at sea. We are without root. And depending on how far this goes, it could lead us to cynicism or even despair. If we begin to think that, well, is there really a God in this universe? Is there really meaning? Or are we really just simply a bunch of atoms that are randomly put together by random probabilities? rather than a plan of, a, of an eternal, loving, gracious God. <clears throat> In times of relative economic prosperity, people may live their lives without much thought of God. There may come time where their overall sense of direction is upended for one reason or another. In C.S. Lewis's case, before he came to God, there was World War I. World War I upset many people's views that maybe the world was not <clears throat> going in the direction of worldwide prosperity. There had been some progress for a period of time and perhaps people thought that yes, humankind is getting better over, over time, but World War I <laughs> and then World War II came pretty much changing the view of the world on whether the world as a whole was getting better. And now the concern was, are we going to annihilate ourselves entirely? Without a hope in an eternal, loving, gracious God, We could move in the direction of, of nihilism, of atheism, without a basis for living a lives of self-control, godliness, uprightness. We would have no reason to conduct ourselves in accordance with eternal guidelines. The author of Hebrews reminds his listeners that their hope is built on something eternal. It is not built on something that cannot be relied on. It's built on the character of God, an eternal God. <clears throat> For the Jewish people, there was no greater example than that of Abraham. Of course, Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And Abraham went up on the mountain with his son with a knife in obedience to God, not knowing what the outcome was going to be. He just knew he had to obey God, that he could put his trust in him. And just as he was about to slay his son, God put a stop to that and said, I have seen your faith and I have provided you 
a sacrifice. There was the ram in the thicket. And Abraham was able to make that sacrifice with the sacrifice that God provided. And God made an oath, a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. It says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. Let me back up at a couple of verses. It says, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of this place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall the nations, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived in Beersheba. Through faith, Abraham trusted that God would provide, and he surely did. And seeing Abraham's obedience, God swore that Abraham's seed would bless all of the nations of the world. And this was the promise that God's people relied on through many years of <laughs> dangers, toils, and snares wanderings in the desert, longing to re return, longing to get to the promised land when they got out of Egypt, but then also longing to return to the promised land from the time of the exile. There was a trust and a binding, abiding hope that God would fulfill his eternal promises. <clears throat> We come also to a phrase in this chapter that the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is from a Psalm of David, Psalm 110, where the Lord promises to send forth from Zion, his mighty scepter, to rule in the midst of Israel's enemies. That God's eternal plan and the promises that he made to Abraham and to his people would be fulfilled. We sing a number of songs and the more songs I put together, the more I realize that within our faith and even within the hymns that we sing in our faith, the people of God have recognized this truth that we have an anchor that keeps the soul. So there's a song in our songbook, number 467, listen to, some of these verses, and they only echo what we read in Hebrews on this theme. <clears throat> Here's the question. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? 
when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Our hope is built not on what we have done, but on what Christ has done on the cross through his resurrection and through his being seated <coughs> at the right hand of the throne of God and trust that one day he will return and death will be swallowed up in victory. And our light and momentary troubles will mean nothing compared with the glory that will be revealed. Is, is it safely moored? Will the storm withstand? For tis well secured by the Savior's hand, and the cables passed from his heart <laughs> sorry, to mine can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul safe and secure while the billows roll. Standing on the rock which cannot move, grounded, firm, and deep in the Savior's love. Add to that song other songs that we sing. Time is filled with swift transition, but we are to hold to God's unchanging hand. What about this one? How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. We can trust what God says. What about this one? Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Standing on the promises of God. <clears throat> and then, of course, this morning, we also sang the song before communion, as a matter of fact. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. <laughs> I pray that this morning, as we do live in times of swift transition, in times where it seems like things that we relied on are on unsolid ground. Let us build our hopes on things eternal. <clears throat> and I think it is for this reason that the writer to the Hebrews wrote what he did, because he says, when our hope is in something that death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, any powers, height, depth, anything else, when nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that gives us a firm foundation from which to live. That then will give us endurance and hope and to use whatever God has given us for his purposes. We can then use those funds that he may put into our hands. We may use that education that we may put into the hands for the better benefit of others. We can use, we can bless others in the relationships that we have and be strong and make them matters of blessing when we when we put our hope when in god but then take the gifts that he gives us the vaccines the various forms of legislation that might improve 
life in some form or fashion, then these good things, these blessings, these wonderful things have their right place. We don't put our hope in them, but once our hope is solidly on the ground of Christ, then we can be grateful for the resources and blessings that God entrusts to us. As we go from this place, may we move forward with a steadfast hope in our eternal foundation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you for these words that give us great encouragement and hope. Help us never, Lord, to turn our eyes away from you, the wellspring of living water, the solid rock of our salvation. Grant, O oh God, that we may indeed find our security in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.